are live, I believe, on Tuesday the 6th of September. Uh, if you are joining me on the live chat on YouTube, be sure to say hello. Um, this is A. Thompson and Other Disappointments. This is episode 109. Can't believe I'm on 109 episodes already. Um, if it's your first time joining, uh, this is a podcast that primarily focus, focuses on uh, news and politics and dystopia. Um, there's 100 episodes you can go back and check out all at funk-27.co.uk. Uh, previous guests include Marina Perkis, Otto English, Super Tansky, uh, David Lowther, Dane Baptiste, Jim Felton. There's quite a few. There's quite a few to choose from. Uh, and I'm having lots of fun doing it. I do a Wednesday show normally, uh, which is a solo episode. Um, and then I do a, uh, a Friday night uh, episode when I normally get a guest in. Um, last week's guest uh, was Sean Adams last Friday night. And we talked about uh, Brexit and we talked about the changing shape of media and its toxicity and whether we imagine things might get, I don't know, a little bit better in the coming years, we hope. Um, so that was that was interesting. He's he's significantly more sort of intellectual and tapped into uh, to things than I am. Uh, so I always feel a, a little bit like unqualified, a little bit imposter syndrome-y uh, when I talk to guests because it's like I'm just a bit of a piss taker. I class myself as a humorist more than anything, if not a sort of, you know, comedian slash failed comedian. Um so then when I get sort of serious guests on and we have a, a you know, a serious slash semi-serious conversation about politics and the future and how fucked it's got, what we can do to change things, I always feel a little bit like, hang on a second, like, why do you, <laughs> why do you care what I think? I, you know, talk about my arsehole and laugh at dick jokes and shit, but... Um... Anyway, hopefully, hopefully that is uh, of interest to you. Uh, I mean, intellectual conversation about politics, not dick jokes, clearly. Uh, joining me, uh, I was going to say joining me tonight, as in like I've got, now I've got guest shows stuck in my head. Um, uh, let, let me get on to what we're talking about tonight is, is probably a smarter way of jumping into the actual topic of conversation for this episode. Um, they're normally more fluid than this. If it is your first time listening, they're normally more fluid than this. I'm clearly, I'm not on my A game tonight. Very tired today. My daughter keeps waking me up at like 4am and then it's just, you know, then it's just a long day. Then it's just, it's just a lot, as they say in the States. Uh, today's a big news day, isn't it? Liz Truss is now our prime minister, which I can't believe I'm saying those words. Do you remember at the beginning of the Tory leadership race? And it was almost like she was a joke candidate, I felt. She was like, she has no charisma. She's got no real record. People often like wheel out, oh, she was a fantastic foreign secretary. She was a fantastic Brexit secretary. She signed trade deals, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, she didn't. <laughs> she just fucking replaced existing deals with like rollover deals. That's what she did. And then she took a lot of it. I always felt like she, if she got sacked, if she wasn't successful in the Tory leadership race and she got sacked by whoever was, she would have a very rich career in shit Instagram influencery shit. Like you could totally imagine her selling candles. I could. Anyway. Um, but anyway, there's there's no justice in the world and there's no talent in the Tory party. And so... Obviously, she has risen up the ranks and won the fucking leadership contest. I will say this, that I thought, as I think a, a lot of people on the left and the centre-left thought, I thought Penny Mordaunt was going to smash it. I know a lot of people were saying, you know, Rishi is quids in to, to be the successor. And then there was a lot of accusations of backstabbing. and But but then I thought, if, if it's not Rishi Sunak... It will be Penny Morden because she's got her head screwed on. She's a fantastic communicator. And I always talk about this uh, when I'm talking about like American politics, but it's also true of English politics uh, or British politics um, that she survives the beer test, which if you're if I've not talked about this on the pod, it, like the times that you have been tuned in or listened to it, the beer test is just essentially which candidate would you rather go for a beer with? I don't know if that sounds really juvenile and childish, but it fucking works. It's like 
Barack Obama versus Mitt Romney. Honestly, tell me you wouldn't rather sit down for a bottle of Bud with Barack Obama. Obviously you would. He's a cool guy. He's got charisma. He's kind of fun and funny. If if you ignore the extrajudicial killings via drone bombs. I mean, like, if, you, if, if you're able to compartmentalise his more problematic a- aspects of his personality, then he appears to pass the beer test, is what I'm saying. Uh, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn... Nil score draw, I guess. Wasn't it like a hung parliament? Did she, did she like lose her majority that she inherited from David Cameron? Because neither of them, I wouldn't want to go for a beer with either of them, frankly. Like Corbyn seems a lovely guy and great policy ideas and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but it, I don't think he's someone I would enjoy going for a beer with, just the same as I wouldn't want to crack open a bottle of wine with Theresa May. You know, they're not interesting people, not interested in what makes them tick or hearing their stories. I I think both of them are probably quite boring to hang out with. Then you get to the more recent elections. This is like Boris Johnson and... Uh, what well, Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, wasn't it? First? Uh, I would argue that Boris Johnson, I hate the guy. You hate the guy. I'm guessing you hate him if you listen to my podcast. Nobody fucking likes him that's connected with me, clearly. But... You can see how people would warm to him. He inarguably does have charisma. I'm not saying I like him. I don't like him. I fucking loathe the guy. But before his tenure as PM, you could see how he had charisma. He gave speeches. They were titillating. He used metaphors. He was sort of seemingly quick-witted, although now we're sort of looking, you know, we're through the looking glass. That takes on a different form, doesn't it? He comes off now as flustered and desperate. Um, and narcissistic. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people who will be listening to this who'll be like, that was always the case, Aid. We could always see that. Why couldn't you? And I could, to some extent. But I'm just saying that it, if it's the choice out of candidate A or candidate B, and if candidate A gives amusing dinner speeches and wins people over like that, and has guested on Top Gear, and been on Have I Got News For You, and all of these other pro... If he's sort of garnered a bit of a high profile for being a bit of a joker, and won over London, maybe he's got more charisma and he probably passes the beer test versus Jeremy Corbyn. I don't know. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying the beer test tends to win. Um... And when we look at the beginning of this leadership race, Liz Truss fucking failed the beer test. Hilariously failed it. She's the least I would want to go for a beer with out of that lot. Penny Morden, as I say, good communicator, I would have said passes the beer test. She at least comes off like she inhabits somewhere close to reality. But... Unfortunately, the ERG felt differently <laughs> and they all rallied behind Liz. I'd love to be a fly on the wall of the ERG meetings. Like, what the fuck wins the entirety of the ERG over? Like, did she just walk in waving flags and, like, singing Blitz songs? Let's all go down the strand, you know? Is that all it takes? Anyway... We now have a new Prime Minister. Her name is Liz Truss. Yes, she won the leadership. And it only took her 9,726 days. So that's good. Fucking hallelujah. There are entire seasons of reality shows designed to filter down to a final two (laughs) and then a winner that could have been thought showered, produced commissioned, aired, been and gone in the time it's taken the Conservative Party to choose a fucking leader. (laughs) Like, it's... Like, it's a fairly damning indictment of the speed with which government operates in this country, is it not? And she's succeeding Johnson. We know this. Um, She's succeeding Boris Johnson, uh, who, who, according to his resignation speech is something of a booster rocket. 
that's fulfilled his purpose and will now silently return to the earth in some obscure corner of the Pacific. I think that's what he said, almost word for word. And I hope that's true. <laughs> I mean, I don't... I don't necessarily want to see him take his winnings and fuck off, you know, like do the dinner circuit, make like three, four million and then just, you know, live some untouched retirement on some, you know, like millionaire's island in the Pacific just off South America. I don't I don't necessarily want to see him enjoy that retirement. I think if there was any justice in the world, he'd be hounded till the end of his days days like people milkshaking him <laughs> with like two litre bucket cups of Portsmouth sewage following him around just tossing him like at his speaking engagements and shit people would stand up there and be like and our next speaker for this evening's gala is former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom Boris Johnson you know rounds of applause from polite you know dinner jacket guests who have paid 700 pounds or 2000 pounds to sit there and he gets up on the stage and he stutters a bit i i i, I thank you yes it 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 it's it, 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 uh, lovely to be here in in, in uh, oslo or, or indeed as the uh, latin great peoples of uh, uh, fuckshire used to refer to it uh, the city of uh, well, well, what the fuck oh jesus for the love of god you know like a milkshake of shit just lands on him at the podium carries on the sidelines like this is never going to stop happening, is it? Like, <laughs> that's what I want his post-parliamentary career to be like. Having domestics with his wife. You know, Johnson from across the stage going like, it's it's fine, Carrie, it's fine. I always carry two spares for this exact reason, you know, like... And she's like, you shouldn't have to, Boris. You, should, you shouldn't have to. It's not a normal thing to have to always carry an extra pair of suits with you that you can switch into on a moment's notice like you're some weird fucked up Tory version of Clark Kent this isn't normal Boris and he wouldn't have a spare suit anyway would he like I mean he'd just change into one of his rugby shirts you know guaranteed rock back up to the, like, the podium 17 minutes later once he's washed himself down but he'd be wearing a rugby shirt and he'd make some awful joke some awful pun like i don't know having to take shit from everyone i mean that is that is precisely what he would do is it not just like we've grown to know and loathe him to such an extent we can predict with 100 percent accuracy how he he would behave <laughs> in that scenario gets a, a cup of shit thrown at him <laughs> like he's a i don't know what was that band at glastonbury they let them open i can't remember their fucking name now they it was um it was two girls and they were like 18 years old or something and they did that song like you ugly you ugly your mama says you ugly or something like that it's like a trashy pop song and they got like cups of piss thrown at that's what i want that's what i want his post-parliamentary career to look like somebody throws a cup of shit at him and then he would he would say like oh, i always take shit from everyone that's exactly what he would say and we can predict that now because we know and loathe him let's move on here's a weird question right do you think he even got a cleaner in to fix up Downing Street before he left. Because I doubt it. <laughs> I reckon I reckon the flat above number 10 was a fucking state. Just takeaway boxes, CCJs pinned to the fridge, wine stains on the sofa, remnants of frankly booge wallpaper that's been angrily, hastily removed and torn <laughs> off the walls. And then, the, you know, a charred, burnt effigy of Sunak in the corner, probably. And I imagine, like, Truss walking in the door, you know, like a fucking Disney movie. Walks in this door to the flat above number 10, opens the door, puts both suitcases down, you know, ready to do that relieved sigh they do in the movies, you know. Ah, this is my new home, you know. <laughs> and instead she creaks the door open. She's like, what the fuck is this place? He's on 120 grand a year and he couldn't shout a fucking tenancy clean, really? 
I bet it's awful after he's been living there. I bet it's fucking terrible. Just hasn't been hoovered in months. As I say, takeaway boxes everywhere. Just fucking ugh. They're going to end up like one of those aristocratic couples you read about, you know? Where they move exclusively in circles of the privately educated. Three holiday homes. Every son and daughter born with a Coots account. And yet, living in squalor, you know? Like, like that aristocratic couple years and years ago. Uh, I don't know if you saw this story. It was in, I think it was in the Daily Mail or the Daily Express. But they they were addicts. Like they got onto cocaine and they got onto this and a bit of that. And, and they lived the life of fucking addicts. But they were aristocrats. And she died of an overdose. I think they were on heroin. I think, or maybe it was crack. Maybe it was crack, actually. Crack feels, that's ringing more bells now. But they were aristocrats and they were crack addicts. I'm just going to say that. You can fact check it if you like. I don't give a fuck. Uh, they were crack addicts. And she had an overdose and she died and he just left her fucking body there rotting in some side room of their like London townhouse. And the judge spared him jail because, you know, he's. I think he's been through enough. It was something along those lines. But they were aristocrats and they lived like fucking junkies. And it was a really sad story, actually. I'm sorry, I'm not going way off on a tangent now. But it was a really sad story because they had kicked drugs and kicked alcohol completely they'd removed it from their lives because they saw how much damage it was doing and then on the millennium new year's eve 1999 just before it ticks over to to new year's day into the new millennium they both looked at each other apparently and they were like oh let's just have a glass of champagne and that just sent them fucking careering spiraling back into just a druggy junky nightmare and it climaxed or you know descended for want of a better word, uh, into the death of this poor woman. And that is kind of where I want Boris Johnson to be head. No, wait, that's too dark. That is too dark. I don't know. Is it too dark? 200,000 dead. Is that... Is it wrong to... <laughs> is it okay to wish death? Or... No, that's not... That's, let's not go down that road. I, basically, I just want to see them get some awful reality TV thing made about them. I'd be happy with that. They can be aristocrats who live in squalor, and then there's a terrible TV program made about them on Channel 5, you know, when aristocrats go wrong, you know? It'd be like the opposite of poverty porn shows. You know? Like that, um... You know the kind of shows I'm talking about, like Can't Pay, Take It Away? Or like The Bailiffs or whatever, you know? Like, you've seen that shit. Now get ready for aristocrat hoarders. That's that's kind of... That's what I want to see them have a, a TV show kind of made about the squalor that they end up... Living. Like, maybe that's why they... Is that why they hate Channel 4 and the BBC so much? You know, they just neuter the entire news and current affairs output of the most celebrated British media institutions on the off chance they were planning on exposing how disgusting you are. And I get it. <laughs> I understand. Like, I'm not knocking that. Christ. Any producers come knocking on my door, you know, they're like, yeah, I'm uh, Doug Fairfax from Channel 5's new show. Uh, it's called Podcasters Who Once Got Gacked Out on Cocaine and Talked Utter Garbage to Strangers for Five Hours. We'd like to do an episode on you. I would table a hostile takeover quicker than you can say, jump on my Patreon. Um. Anyway, trust is in. She's given a speech. She's tweeted some shit. And, uh... And this is what she's tweeted. Let's have a quick look. She's tweeted, As your Prime Minister, I am confident that together we can ride out the storm, rebuild our economy, and become the modern, brilliant Britain that I know we can be. I will take action every day to make that happen so that's nice that's good i mean let's pick it apart a little bit shall we she's confident that together we can ride out the storm which has been caused by her party not implementing a meaningful price cap rebuild our economy which her party has decimated and become the modern 
brilliant Britain that I know we can be. And this modern brilliant Britain is juxtaposed against the, what, 19th century that Jacob Rees-Mogg embodies, uh, the Blitz period that they're all fucking obsessed with. Modern, brilliant Britain. Fantastic. Okay, well, I'm excited. I don't know about you guys. And she will take action every day to make that happen. So, as I say, that's that's really nice. Nothing, nothing about donors in there, which I find a bit weird. There's nothing about what she's going to do for the donors. If I was a donor, I would want to know... What are you like? What are you pla like? I think that's the thing I find most disgusting. <laughs> like, I can handle a bit of corruption. I can handle a bit of lying. You know, keep things a bit spicy <laughs> for politainment. But this endless, tedious fucking pantomime that they're governing for the people is just like insulting theatre, you know? Like, they get some money from the state. She gets some money, about 120 grand from, from memory. I could be wrong. Who cares, really? I don't know. It's basically, you know, it's, it's 120, 130 grand from, uh, from the state to do her job, right? And we should have... I think there's a reasonable expectation that she should work for the people. And they put up this pretense, this theatre, that they work for the people. But they don't really... And yet, 120 grand a year should come with some responsibility and goals and targets, right? It should be accountable. We should have some mechanism there for holding her accountable for what she says she's doing when she says that she's governing for the people. And look, no doubt some people will say it is accountable in the form of elections. But honestly, that's like choose your fucking abuser, you know, most of the time. Now, don't get me wrong. I want the Tories out. I'm not totally disillusioned. You know, like the brigade of Bellandry on my timeline. People go, Labour will be just as bad. You know, that's not me. But no, I don't think Labour are perfect, by the way. I don't think anyone is perfect. And neither should you. <laughs> I don't want to get all, you know, thou shalt not worship false idols and all that, but... If you've got a political hero, like, that is a weird thing to frame your identity around, especially if you're over 25. Like, if your frontal lobe has fully developed, but you still have posters on your wall kind of thing, <laughs> and you have one single Labour or Green Party or, you know, momentum -y personality that you endlessly go on about, like they're your fucking saviour, or society's saviour, or Britain's saviour, you know? And it's them and no one else, you know? If that's you, you know, and all your friends roll their eyes when you bring them up again and again, like, oh, God, he's going on about Zara Sultana again, like, what the fuck? Like, we were talking about the weather, you know? <laughs> or maybe it's like, does he never shut up about West Streeting? Oh, my God. He's changed his profile to a picture of him and Wes Streeting. It's not even a real picture. He's photoshopped it. Like, that's that's Wes and his brother. And he's put his own face on Wes's brother. Oh, Christ. He's making my fucking minge cringe with this shit. Like, because here's the thing, Amy. Like, he didn't, he didn't have an outside photograph of himself, of his own body next to a friend. Because <laughs> he doesn't have any friends. <laughs> He just has a... He doesn't have a picture of himself outside, even, to put Wes's face on his friend's body because he's that much of a lunar recluse now and he never leaves his flat because he stays in, radicalised without a terror cell, sat alone, online, tweeting at 3am at Wes. Like, oh, my God, Wes, I was just saying the same thing. <laughs> oh, my God, Wes, I see you were in Darlington last week. I used to go there every Thursday on my old job. Please follow back. I think you're tops. I loved your appearance on Question Time. I mouth along to it because I know all the words. Wes, I know all the words, Wes. Like, if that's you, here's what you need to do. You need to unplug your laptop, put down your phone, turn off the 24-hour news channels, and kill yourself. You need to save your friends from the molar-crushing indignity cringe 
of your disgusting existence because literally nobody wants to hear you say another fucking thing about Wes Streeting. I promise you. Even Wes Streeting, I assure you, is a bit tired of Wes Streeting. And in this weird fantasy I'm having of a mentally ill, obsessive West Streeting Stan fan, this person is like 35, so old enough to know better, frankly. Wow, that was a weird rant to go on at someone. If you worship idols like that, that is a dangerous psychology to get into. You know, I don't have anything against Streeting. I'm just saying, don't make people your heroes like that. It's fine when you're 14. Or 17, maybe. Or 21, if you have a favourite rapper. That's fine. That's cute. But not when you're 35 and you're on Twitter with your senior admin assistant job and your parental responsibilities. And then the third pillar to your personality, I'm a huge West Streeting fan. Really? <laughs> it always ends badly. <laughs> Which is why my Patreon is a cult, incidentally. Because I'm positive I'll end up disappointing someone who will take it the wrong way and misrepresent it to a bot farm and cause me loads of problems, you know, which would be problems if I was a candidate for being an MP or an actual MP or a TV presenter or a pop star. But that's why it's a cult. Because then it's full unflinching loyalty, you know, Scientology levels of, of dedication. Don't go leaving the Patreon now, Roy, when you're this close to level three Delta, which is where I explain the cosmic origins of your deep, unquenchable inner sadness. Don't leave now, Roy. You're almost there. Maybe I should change a £10 a month tier to that shit. That's my goal for the Patreon. Although, weirdly, when you set the thing up, Patreon asks you to define your goals and... That bit was a bit long on characters, so. Anyway, look, let's get back to Liz Truss. I know maybe some of you are jumping in for the first time. You're like, what the fuck is this? I thought he was going to talk about Truss. <laughs> He's talking about, like, psychology and starting a cult. Like, where, where have I ended up? What weird corner of the internet is this shit? Truss's speech. Let's take a look. So she paid tribute to Johnson in the first, like, sentence or two, which is, I mean... I don't know, pay tribute by all means, but I think Johnson would rather you paid cash, bro. Hi, yo! That is the one late night with Jimmy Fallon joke I've got here. But yeah, she she said he delivered Brexit, the COVID vaccine, and that he stood up to Russian aggression. Uh, which, look, I don't want to... See, here's the thing. I don't want to rag on a new prime minister when they first get into the job and they're at that first lecture, lecture, lectern appearance. You know, I want to have some class. I want to be reasonable. Like we should all try and be a bit good sport about this a bit, shouldn't we? But then it's like, you know, this wasn't a general election victory. If it was a GE victory, I'd be bummed out the Tories got in again. But there's a place for good sportsmanship, I think. You know, there's a place for that sort of World Cup quarterfinal being a good sport when your team loses. You know, like the better team won. Uh, I hope they go on to win it. You know, that sort of thing. But this is more like, oh, great. You know, we got rid of one vapid self-serving sack of shit. I doubt anyone could fill his shit. Oh, wait, no, here's another one. You know, it's like... I imagine it like a sort of, you know, a, a child's cartoon where the evil, you know, the bad guy, you kill him off and then he instantly regenerates, you know, like a clone regenerates in the background. Ring! Oh, shit, he's back, you know, like that sort of thing. Like I've said this before, right? But they always congratulate themselves for having like a, a woman leader and they're doing it again today. Liz Truss gives this speech at the, the lectern and people are like, well, you know, another female prime minister for the Tories. Congratulations, fellas. We've we've so diverse. Like they always congratulate themselves for diversity. Like we've had three female PMs. We've got a cabinet full of black and South Asian heritage 
people. Not just men, people, guys. We're very diverse. But they're all fucking privately educated and bucked up to the nines. So it's a little bit like, look at us, we're very diverse. No, you, you just found a slightly different group of sociopaths. A slightly more diverse selection of sociopaths. Congratulations, you tap dancing tossers. So I don't feel particularly bad ragging on her like this, you know? She didn't win a general election. I don't think she's there because she's a woman and because they're amazing and super diverse. She's there because she inherited the job, you know? Not because she beat Labour, which, thank fuck, it appears from polling like that's probably beyond her skill set and probably in good company for other things that are outside of her skill set. <laughs> Beating Labour seems out of reach for her for now, right? But she's at the podium tonight, or th this evening it was. She's at the podium because her predecessor and her party are corrupt, murderous sociopaths, and one of them got found out. He got found out a lot. And so now here she is inheriting this role. She's like a substitute teacher, right? So I feel like she's fine to... To rag on a bit. I don't feel like I'm being a bad sportsman or uncouth or not classy. Although, you know, let's be real, very few of these episodes are particularly classy. There's a lot of effing and blinding, guys. Not going to sugarcoat it for you. It's a fucking bear pit of swearing, this podcast. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't claim to be classy. Um, so back to the ragging. So she pays tribute to Johnson and she comes out with three lies straight off, <laughs> straight off the bat. She says he got Brexit done, he delivered the vaccine, and he stood up to Russian aggression. That's what she says. I'd like to pay tribute to my predecessor. He, he got Brexit done, he delivered the vaccine, and he stood up to Russian aggression. So if he got Brexit done, why was there a big right-wing rag headline two weeks ago saying whoever takes over needs to finish the job on Brexit? That was, a, I think it was the Express. Whoever takes over or whoever comes after me, the successor, needs to finish the job on Brexit. So either he got Brexit done or it needs finishing. So what the fuck? And even that aside, like, what, the, what the fuck is going on with the protocol? Like, like she's literally standing there congratulating him for delivering a Brexit that is in her fucking in tray. 15 feet behind her so great like she's already a moron yeah congratulations for finishing the thing that's so unfinished it's in my entry thanks you did a great job like either that or she's being quite clever you know i don't know do you think um do you think here's a weird question right this is actually quite clever do you think it's like a um a blame management tactic you know, a blame management tactic. Like she's congratulating him for delivering Brexit. Like that's his thing, you know, his chaos, his exploding A-bomb of awfulness that he has left us with. You know, does that make sense? She's like, thank you for your work delivering and completing Brexit, Boris, you know? Is it that? Could it be that clever? If you don't understand, right, it's like me. It's like me going, um, I'd like to congratulate my girlfriend for raising my children. And people are like, eight, um, they're in the house. They're like one year old and six years old. They're very, very much unfinished at this point i'm like nope no no i think i uh <laughs> think i got the job done no no Aid, um no they're gonna need a lot more work i mean your son's six and he's basically feral i'm like I, no again i'd like to congratulate my girlfriend for delivering my fully raised children which are totally her responsibility you know just completely outsourcing the blame for something i couldn't be fucked to handle properly do you know what i mean so maybe she's a fucking genius. I don't know. I think it's one of those situations where you have to say, 
is she incredibly stupid or is she a genius? Let's look at all of her past endeavours and past successes to decide if history can tell us if this person is a genius. And then I think you, you reach the conclusion, uh, maybe she herself is not quite a finished article. I don't know. <laughs> the second thing, he delivered the vaccine. That's what she says. She wants to congratulate her predecessor on his achievements, and it, that was delivering Brexit, which we know is ridiculous. Uh, and he delivered the vaccine. Utter fucking nonsense. Pharmaceutical companies delivered the vaccine. The NHS delivered the vaccine. You could make a case that Matt Hancock threw money at it. But honestly, I mean, what the fuck else was he going to do? <laughs> Every country threw money at it. Lots and lots of money. I mean, this, like, oh, he delivered the vaccine. It's a tiny variation on that whole, the fastest rollout of the vaccine because of Brexit, you know? But that's been debunked so many times. Uh, you know, I guess all they're left with is this shit now, is Boris Johnson flew in with a cape and delivered the vaccine. Well, fucking great. <laughs> nice to know that we're living in fantasy here, Lizzie. And the third thing, he stood up to Russian aggression. Right. Stood up to. That's... Is that what we're calling it? Cool. Okay. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Mate, he drank down rubles of Russian money. He sat on the Russian report. He didn't want to release it. He partied with the kids of KGB agents and made one of them a fucking lord. <laughs> stood up to and you think this is the guy that's standing up to russians really is that is that standing up to people because look i'm not a violent guy but i would happily get in an altercation with this prick if that's his definition of standing up to people you know i'd be like oh johnson give me your fucking wallet you pussy i i i i, I will stand up to you so i will <laughs> I, I will stand up to you with a steadfast, unwavering commitment to a, appeasing your every desire. You know, like I mean, it is—it's—it's it's one way to stop aggression, I suppose. Uh, give me your wallet, or I'll open your head. Oh, all right, uh, here's my wallet, and and uh, I could suck you off. Well, all right, yeah, that is actually rather calming. Thank you. <laughs> The other thing in the speech um, was she laid the blame for the energy crisis at Putin's door, which I thought was interesting. Because, look, I'm not... I am not a Putin fanboy, you know? I look at Putin's murder of journalists. Uh, I look at his geopolitical aggression. I look at the pain that he's putting his own people through. I look at the decimation of ukrainian identity and i look at his uh overreach in terms of poisoning people on our shores i still think it was probably russia that were behind the dead spy in uh, london in Vauxhall, um and the guy that got poisoned in the fucking sushi restaurant i look at all of that and i think i don't like that guy i'm definitely not a fan i'm not a putin fanboy Clearly, there's an impact on energy supply when you wrap sanctions around a major gas producer like Russia. Clearly, right? I'm not... I'm, I'm definitely not going to sound like a Putin fucking apologist here, right? I just mean, if you're going to lay the... You can't... If we're talking about the energy crisis, honestly, if we're really talking about this honestly and why it's a problem for Britons, everyday Britons right now, you know... Can we just have an honest conversation about this on today of all days? You know, markets wise, the sanctions are pretty devastating, right? You wrap sanctions around Russia. It's devastating for the gas and oil markets. But the gas prices here aren't this bad because Putin invaded Ukraine. They're this bad because the government have manifestly failed to step in in the way they have done in countries like France. 
And they're this bad because we left the European energy market where the spikes in the costs are spread out across the block to manage them so no one area gets fucking hammered. This is a failure of government on an epic scale. And her party are like 11 points behind in the polls because the previous administration were dishonest, lied and obfuscated about this. And the problems it caused came knocking at your door, my door, everyone's door. And we all got angry about it. And they've slipped further and further in the polls through lying and being dishonest and not handling it properly. And now here she is, this fucking idiot, at her podium, saying the same obvious untruths and obfuscations as her predecessor. Right on, like, on her maiden fucking speech. It's kind of unbelievable. It's like... This is how you're starting, really. And she made a few comments too about the sort of Britain that she wants to build. Um, the usual bollocks about you know how we're a determined nation, and I don't know. She, she was, she was bigging up Britain. She said things like, um, "We, we have huge reserves of energy." Like she meant that we're all ready to get stuck in, like our work ethic. You know, she's got a big thing about Britons being lazy and graft. Do you remember that from a couple of weeks ago? But I don't know, like saying huge reserves of energy at a time when almost the entire reason we're being hit with these costs on our bills is because the Tories sold off our reserves. <laughs> like where we house our energy, storage facilities. They fucked that all up. They sold off the land. It was going to be developed on. Now they're trying to panic buy it back. Like, that's a big part of why we're getting hit with these spiking energy costs. Because they fucked up. Because we don't have huge reserves of energy. And here she is in her speech going like, we have huge reserves of energy amongst the Britons. Like, like is that... Was that a prank? Is someone pranking her on her first fucking day? You know, like, I imagine the script writers, you know, the speech writers in the back, they're just like... This this will be funny, guys. Just going back to the, the graph thing, that's a big source of fear, I think, for a lot of us. Is like she has this idea in her head that places like China and India have hard graft in them, culturally, ethically. They've just they just work harder over there, guys. Which I always say, I think I said this on a previous episode, it's like, okay, well, let's explore that a li little bit, right? If they've got such culturally, like, hard, innate work ethic, why is it when we get asylum seekers from, I don't know, India, or immigrants from India, or asylum seekers from Afghanistan, or Iran, or wherever, other countries where work ethic is culturally quite strong... <laughs> Why is it when they arrive on our shores, we're always like, ah, oh, fucking lazy immigrants. They're just here for a handout. Why is that? It can't be both. And so then if you accept that actually the reason that they work so hard in places like China or India is because they're being oppressed. Well, then let's have a conversation about that. What are you actually suggesting? Are you suggesting that you want to take away workers' rights? Because that's how it sounds. And there's a big thing about that is that is that trust does want to strip away worker rights that that is part of leaving the eu is a big thing about brexit big manufacturers would be really really keen to slash your holiday pay to make you work longer hours to make you like here's a fucked up question which i will leave you on now because i've been talking for quite a while uh here's a weird question if they did slash worker rights and they said to you like let's say you're on 30k a year and then your boss says to you, look, I know you work Monday to Friday and you work nine till 5.30 with an hour lunch, but 33K is a cost of living crisis on. We can actually increase that to 38K, but you work on Saturdays for five hours. Like not a full day, it's just five hours. Would you accept that? Because it's kind of, it sounds like they're doing you a favor, doesn't it? It's, well, it's not much. Excuse me. It's not a long day, is it? Five hours? And I get an extra five grand. What did I say? 33 to 30. Yeah, five. An extra five grand? Yeah, that could help. I'm going for a mortgage soon. 
anything I can do to up my salary, plus there's been no wage growth for the last 12 years, anything I can do to increase my salary in, at a time when the Bank of England is telling me to not ask for a raise because I might fuel inflation, anything I can do, yes, okay, I'll sign on the dotted line, 38k, and I've just lost a little bit more of my free time. Like, how far would you accept them pushing? Look, uh, I know we said four weeks holiday, but Truss has just signed a little bit of legislation where actually now it's only three and it's optional for us to give you the extra week. But we will give it to you, but only if we uh, only if you sign this contract that says that you'll do five hours on a Saturday. But in exchange for the five hours on a Saturday, we'll increase your salary very, very modest. Like we're going to get into that sort of rhetoric and I don't think it'll be that far. I think what will happen if if the Tories win the next general election, I can totally see them, especially if it's a big majority. I can totally see them trying to table that sort of legislation. Like, just put it in the hand. It's time the government get off the backs of industry. It's time to cut that red tape. It's time to embrace and let the British lion roar. No longer will we be held back by the evil communist EU namby-pamby snowflake legislation that we fought hard to regain our independence from. Now it's time for ABC Capital down the road or Vodafone or this company or that company or, you know, to be able to make you work an extra hour a day, sacrifice a week of your annual leave, trash, like throw in the bin your paternity leave, that'll go, and will increase your salary very modestly, but then you have to work half a day on Saturday. Like, that's where we're fucking headed. Mark my words, said the armchair expert of politics. So certain was he that his opinion and prediction was correct. Having actually, do you know what? Talking myself down there, I, I put a bet on Brexit and it won. And I put a bet on Trump and that won. So I have, I've got some previous here, guys. Um, listen, that's about it for this episode. Uh, thank you for indulging me. I hope you find these at least a, a little bit interesting, stimulating, and at times uh, amusing. If you're enjoying the podcast, if you've enjoyed two or three episodes of the podcast, um, please do consider jumping on the Patreon. It's where I put the episodes up first. Uh, Patreon subscribers get them first before everyone else. And then two days later, they go out to everyone uh, on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and, and Amazon and all the rest. Um, so all I ask is if you're enjoying them again and again, um, do consider jumping on that. Three pounds a month is the first tier, so it's super cheap. Um, that's just enough to like buy me a beer or a coffee and a doff of the cap and say, thanks, Aid, enjoying the podcast. Uh, five pounds a month gets you a certified Aid Thompson a badge. Uh, asterisk there is no badge um, but it does get you into the cult as it were and we are having our first meetup um, lots of uh, influencers oh my god I'm not an influencer I am a bin influencer uh, that means I don't inspire you I just scrape the bin off the bottom of the dustbin of life and I show it to you and I go oh look at this shit Ugh, let's see if we can roast it a little bit have some beers sit and drink with me and talk about how shit society has become um five pounds a month gets you into the Bintfluencer cult and we are having our first meetup on thursday the 27th of october so what's that about six weeks away um so i'm really excited about that um and then there's a 10 pounds a month uh patreon tier which you can absolutely ignore nobody needs to jump on it at 10 pounds a month frankly it's ridiculous but you have to do three tiers so i stuck that one on there um if you're enjoying the podcast and you're not in a position to support it financially and i will say this look um i'm doing the patreon to build a following for the podcast and the blogs and funk 27 so that i can make it my full-time job that is the end goal i want to take a step back from my uh, day job which is in it um, this is what I really, really enjoy doing is broadcasting to you guys, having a bit of a laugh, building a community. And it's a, it's loads of fun. We've got a Discord chat now um, where uh, some of the other uh, Patreon subscribers are jumping in and we're talking about politics in there. So uh, if you want to support it and continue to help it to grow, uh, do jump on the Patreon. But if you're not in a position to support it financially, 
all I would ask is either leave me a review or share it around, you know, like copy the link to an episode that you've enjoyed and then send it in a WhatsApp chat to somebody that you think might also enjoy it because word of mouth is honestly the best way that these things grow. And I'm super, super thankful to anyone that can help it to grow via sharing um, and also super, super thankful to, to those of you on the Patreon. Um, I'm not going to go through the shout outs name by name on this episode because we're getting super, super long here. 50 minutes of just me talking. So I'll just say thanks very much to everyone on the Patreon. Once again, uh, you guys make my week uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to chatting with more of you in the Discord um, and indeed in person on the 27th of October. Thank you so much once again for listening, everyone. I'll be back on Friday night with a guest. Until then, ciao for now.